Hello and welcome to the fourth session of the DW Global Media Forum Digital 2020. I'm Wasla Tasrat Nazimi and today we will be looking at the issue of diversity in media organizations. Many leaders around the world these days are trying to conquer hearts and minds by sowing discord, creating an us versus them mentality across many parts of society. Let's have a look at what this means. Populist politicians preach nationalism and intolerance as solutions to modern society's problems. And people are listening. Diversity versus division. How news organizations can promote inclusion. Welcome to the fourth online session of the Global Media Forum. Targeting immigrants. Assaulting independent media. Mocking the rule of law. Essential ingredients of the populist playbook. Demagogues thrive on fear-driven politics and disregard for civil liberties. They conquer hearts and minds with divisive messages. How should journalists respond? What contributions can media executives make towards building a more diverse society? How can newsmakers inspire solidarity? Join our discussion. And these are only some of the questions we will explore today. But before I introduce you to our guests, I'd like to share a keynote speech by Armin Laschet, the minister president of the state of North Rhine-Westphalia, Germany's most popular state and partner of the Deutsche Welle Global Media Forum. Dear ladies and gentlemen, 2020 is a year unlike any other we have experienced. The coronavirus pandemic has turned the lives of many people around the world upside down. And the media are faced with great new challenges. The Global Media Forum itself had to find new passes, digital passes. And so I am happy to welcome you today to the Global Media Forum Digital on behalf of the government of North Rhine-Westphalia. In our digital society, social media have facilitated freedom of opinion and information. Everybody can find information on nearly every topic and network with friends, acquaintances and strangers around the world. This is a great step forward that we shouldn't understate with regard to all of the challenges facing us now. One of these challenges is the unprecedented and increasingly swift and easy propagation of fake news, hate speech and conspiracy theories. Even before the coronavirus pandemic, the debates in our society were getting more polarized and emotional. Therefore, independent journalists who carefully research, consider and classify information are becoming ever more important. In these times, the need for reliable information is exceptionally high. More than ever, people are searching for trustworthy journalism. As a result, we must ask, how can journalism fulfill its role in a responsible manner? How can it contribute to a debate culture based on respect? And how can media promote diversity and social cohesion? A crucial factor, of course, are sustainable business models. News media have been facing challenges in their transition to digital journalism. However, journalism not only has to realign itself economically, it must also evolve in terms of content. Trustworthy journalism has to address all classes of society. Moreover, it has to reflect the diverse perspective of different social groups. 
As a consequence, diversity must be present in the media companies themselves. A current study by the Neue Deutsche Medienmacher, an association that works towards diversity in the media and culture, shows that German journalism does not even come close to depicting social reality. Of the chief editors from the 122 largest regional and interregional media who were polled, only 6% have a migration background. Countless groups are not represented at all. There are currently no chief editors in Germany who are black. There are none who come from a Muslim family. Not even the largest groups of immigrants, namely from Turkey, Poland and Russia, are represented at this level. This, although Germany is a country shaped by immigration and where nearly one quarter of our population has at least one parent who didn't hold a German citizenship from birth. We need more diversity within our editorial teams, more diversity within the newspapers, the television broadcasters, the radio stations and online services. All these institutions need diverse structures, from the chief editors to the newsroom and to the on-site reporters. This would give journalism the opportunity to showcase our diverse society, to promote understanding of one another and support social cohesion, and to tap into new tar target groups. Because only when people see themselves and their everyday lives being represented, will they be willing to pay for journalism. How do we create more diversity? How do we achieve and increase faith in the quality of media? I'm convinced that the international alignment of the Global Media Forum offers the right framework for these and many other questions. And as a media digital state, we in North Rhine-Westphalia want to play our part in expanding Bonn's role at the Global Forum for tackling the most pressing questions about the future of media policy and journalism in accordance with the new policy of Deutsche Welle, free information for free decisions. I wish the Global Media Forum much success in its digital format and hope you all have stimulating and inspiring discussions. Thank you, Mr. Laschet, for those inspiring words and for your support. If you, are, if you are following us on Facebook, please comment your questions, discuss in the comments. We'd love to have your insight and we will try to read as many comments as possible later in the show. I'm now being joined by three esteemed guests who will help us explore how the media can help highlight the benefits of diversity. Let's start with Jamie Angus, the director of BBC World Service Group, which provides news in 43 languages around the world. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Hello. Thank you for joining us. I'm also uh, joined by Peter Limburg, director general of Deutsche Welle, Germany's international broadcaster in 30 languages. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Hello, Ursula. And we also have Aruna Roy, a well-known political and social activist from India and co-founder of the Workers and Peasants Strength Union, MKSS. Hello, everybody. A very warm welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us today. Let's perhaps start by taking stock. Mr. Angus, you're responsible for content in 43 languages at the BBC. And Mr. Limburg, you overlook 30 languages at DW. That's quite a lot of languages. Does this mean that diversity is automatically part of a global news organization? Or is it something that still needs to be addressed systematically, Mr. Angus? 
No, I think it's absolutely something we have to work at every day. Uh, there is a, a very vibrant debate going on in the UK at the moment about diversity in national media. And in many ways, the World Service is very lucky because the nature of our staff and specifically the makeup of our uh, 42 language services means that we have a built in diversity amongst uh, ethnic groups that other parts of the BBC even uh, do not have. But we can't be complacent about that because we have a challenge both with uh, diverse staff, black and Asian staff in the most senior on air roles but also in the most senior management roles. I'm delighted to have some very senior management colleagues from ethnic minorities, but it's clear that we haven't yet done enough and need to, to go further. And the BBC itself uh, in the UK is regularly involved in um, serious arguments about uh, how sensitive our domestic coverage is to racial diversity. We had an example of that just in the recent weeks where a BBC News report broadcast a very uh, a, a very offensive racial swear word. And there was an extremely uh, long and loud debate amongst that in the UK, including amongst our own staff. So even though we are lucky to have an incredibly diverse staff in the World Service, we can't be complacent about that. And we always have to work out what more we can do. So let me ask you, what are the measures the BBC is trying to take? Uh, we know that until April next year, the BBC is doing quite a lot and they want to ensure that 20% of crew members in network commissions are from diverse backgrounds. What else is the BBC doing? Well, that's absolutely right. So we've introduced a, a, a ring-fenced commissioning budget of 100 million pounds that will only be used to commission uh, content that is diverse either in the way that it's been written or the in the production staff and the way that it's led so there's a very very concrete financial investment but i think also within our own staff we're doing more both to raise the numbers of staff from ethnic minority backgrounds but as i said in my previous answer to challenge ourselves more to make sure that in the most senior on-air roles and the most senior management roles, we can point to progress because I know that our own staff are telling us uh, not only do they find that we sometimes make mistakes in output, which they find uh, very frustrating and sometimes offensive, uh, but also that they want us to make further progress in terms of career progression into the most senior roles. And I take that very seriously. And my own staff are my harshest critics and therefore the people to whom I listen most carefully in, in setting these challenges for myself as a manager. Thank you, Mr. Angus. It's quite impressive what you just told us. Mr. Limburg, how will you follow up? Because so far, VW does not have a quota. And there's also a lot of debate in, for a few years now at DW. What is your plan? Well, I think we have a similar situation like the BBC. So we have a lot of people coming from very different backgrounds, uh, all the world religions, all the colors of, of skins are represented uh, at Deutsche Welle, but that doesn't automatically mean that we really work diverse. So I think we, we all have to be better in putting teams together which are really diverse and also not only um, by management or staff, but also in the program uh, that we that we are closer to our public and uh, closer to our viewers and users. But yes, I think we have uh, um, concentrated in the past years very much on, on, on gender equality. So for, for instance, Deutsche Welle, I think is quite good because we have 50% of the senior management and the top management are women. So I think this case is quite, quite well um, organized at Deutsche Welle, but that doesn't mean that we, that we, that we, everything is great. And so I think we have to have to look that we bring up more people from ethnic minorities into um, uh, senior management positions. We, we, I think this is something crucial. We have obviously, they're not also only Germans uh, in the management, but a lot of uh, um, uh, people coming from Asia or, or, or the Arab world are in responsible uh, positions. But I think we have to have to do much more. And I think diversity is not only a question of uh, your social background or your ethnic background. It's also uh, the question of diversity in opinions. It's, it's another topic, but it also has to be 
represented. If everybody comes from the same university and comes uh, uh, studied the same things, believes the same things, uh, and lives in the same part of uh, of the center of the city, then it, it doesn't really help. I mean, it also is important that people from different um, backgrounds and different opinions come also to Deutsche Welle and then work together. And we seriously take this very, very, it's, it's a high topic for us, diversity, you, and it has grown in the last month. Thank you. I also want to bring uh, Aruna Roy into the conversation now. Uh, as both Mr. Angus and Mr. Limburg have highlighted, it's not enough to hire people from a different background. We also not need to talk about inclusion and equity. Um, it is also the question, how diverse are we really if only low-level staff is diverse? Do we need more people from diverse backgrounds and decision-making roles? Uh, Aruna Roy, what is your take on this? Actually, I uh, work with uh, very poor peasants and workers. And India has 22 major languages, and uh, we are hemmed in by not only differences in class and caste, which is a very important criteria in this country, but we are also poor and rich. We are the middle class. We have access to different kinds of resources. We are riddled with differences. And so we live with these differences, and we've had to make do with the differences in cultural terms. But in economic terms today, it's very, very bad on the poor. And I think no newspaper in my country is really picking up the economic debate, which is, in a sense, a critical debate for all the minorities, the Muslims, the poor, everybody, because they are being slowly edged out of the mainstream in many ways. So I think what I would like to see in a newspaper, I see occasionally, but not always, and with the growing infringement of all democratic rights on the media, uh, recently there was a reporting of, uh, of an incident where there was a contempt of court on an individual who had raised a very legitimate question by the Supreme Court of India, and it was reported by the Times of India, which is a fairly big newspaper, but it immediately came under the radar of the government uh, authorities. So today in India, we are suffering from uh, a being absolutely gagged about not only the minorities, especially the Muslims who are gagged from freedom of expression, but even people like me who speak for people who amplify their voices, they are all gagged. And we don't get enough space in the print media and absolutely very negligible quantity of the electronic well, media. Do you think this that country. having a quota would change that, having a quota for diversity in the media? I don't quite know whether it will really change. If you change the color of the skin or the religion of the person there, you'll have to change the perception of the individual. I think both these things matter equally. We've had many women uh, as tokenism in India. We have been fighting for all kinds of equality. We want representation by gender, by caste, by religion. But we can't just stop there. It will have to be an identification with the issues and have the courage to speak out. I think mostly what's happened is that the media has has been also gagged. We've been gagged. The media has been gagged. And unfortunately, it's only in the whispering campaign that we all speak the truth. So we will definitely go back to the democracy. special situation in India later in the show. Um, let's also have a look at our poll because we have asked you, our users, what their thoughts are on having a diversity quota in the media. And we had some great feedback. Thank you for your overwhelming support. And the results are quite obvious. Let's just say that under 80% say, yes, we do need a diversity quota to ensure diversity in the media. And only 22% said, no, we don't need one. So we do see that there is a need for more steps into this direction. Um, and we also have a first question from our Facebook community, which I'm very happy about. Let's look at the question. Karen from the UK has a question to Aruna Roy. When Western media managers decide to focus on diversity, does that really have an impact elsewhere, like in India? What are your thoughts, Ms. Roy? It does. For instance, if uh, any of these critical issues that face us today, whether it's the entire victimizing, victimization of the Muslim community, if it is highlighted in, in the media outside India and in the uh, first world, it does make a difference because it impacts the people who are make decision makers. It also impacts the image, the image of India. 
So in a way, it does have an impact and there isn't enough of it. But I think it does. Thank you, Mrs. Roy. I also want to mention again that we have viewers from around the world watching us today. Our users have been commenting and watching from the US, Germany, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Pakistan, India, Australia, to just name a few. There are many more. Um, and if you're just tuning in, this is the GMF um, Global Media Forum panel on diversity versus division, how news organizations can promote inclusion. I want to go back to our panelists. We have been discussing diversity in the media landscape and whether a quota is necessary to ensure diversity. And diversity is, of course, also not just about race. Diversity is intersectional, which means that diversity means different gender identities, people of various ages, disabilities, different classes and different upbringings. Um, let me come back to you, Aruna Roy. You have been fighting for marginalized groups to have a right for information and access to media. And we already spoke about how these groups are being represented in the media staff. Now, I want, I want to look a little bit into the media coverage. Are marginalized people and their interests being represented in the Indian media landscape? You already spoke a little bit, but maybe you can, about this, but maybe you can go more into detail. I would say that if you look at any mainstream paper in the print, we get very flimsy papers these days because of COVID-19. But even otherwise, if you looked at papers that were published in the last six months, the percentage of media that media news that covered either in the print or electronic media the issues of the poor or of the marginalized or of the Muslims or of the women or of the transgender or of all the various in intersections you spoke of would be very marginal. And really the issues are treated more for sensation than for actually addressing issues. So what you really derive from a television program is a series of people shouting at each other, but really not coming to a conclusion, not leading the viewer to understand the issue better. So I think what we need today is a greater percentage of news coverage, greater quality in the way it is addressed. For instance, there is a new education policy which our government has announced, and it has said that all the education will now be in the mother tongue. And they have said Urdu, which is mainly the spoken language of Muslims in India, will not be considered a mother tongue. And why not pray? They are saying it's because there's no state which speaks this language. So an Indian state, we have these many states which constitute the Indian Union. But why haven't any of the newspapers taken this up? Why haven't any media house, whether electronic media, taken it up as a big issue? Mm -hmm. Because after all, it's, it's victimization of a different kind. And this is going to be law. So then the rule of law ultimately will become anti-people. And if we protest against it, against that law, then we become anti the state. We become Thank you. seditious. We become whatever. Thank you, Mrs. Roy, for also highlighting how the media can actually affect politics in different countries. Mr. Limburg, what change can you as a foreign broadcaster, as also as a public broadcaster, bring in these regions? How are these regions covered in the Western media? I think this is one of our key missions to also report about marginalized people, about uh, minorities, about their problems uh, in the society. And we see it as our task to do it. And we do it uh, all around the globe, in, in Asia, in Africa, or in, in, in Latin America. And I think this is one of the most important things international media should do. It's not only being after the big news stories, but it's also um, to see how, how for instance, the, the Rohingyas treated uh, in Myanmar and, and what is the, uh, how our refugees are, um, uh, are doing and uh, uh, women in, in, in India. Um, all these topics, uh, I think, we are very keen on, and, uh, and and so I can and talk the whole afternoon. I will, won't do it. So uh, I think this is a key role for international media. Thank you, Mr. Limburg. Um, Mr. Angus, as as a British public broadcaster, do you carry a special responsibility for regions that belong to the Commonwealth, like India? Um, I do. Well, uh, you, you'd have to ask Aruna what she thinks about that. I mean, we certainly uh, India is now our largest single country audience. So we just measured the audience again this year. We have a 60 million weekly users uh, in India across all platforms. But I think that probably reflects the unique content we're providing for the Indian audience across the seven or eight South Asian languages that we broadcast in. 
uh, you know, Aruna referenced the extraordinarily vibrant but quite frustrating uh, Indian national television media where, you know, you have eight people shouting at each other in a TV box in prime time. And although we enjoy that a bit, it's a guilty pleasure to watch. I think our role as international broadcasters is to do something much more distinctive. We can provide a much greater editorial diversity. Aruna mentioned a couple of the different types of stories which national media will skew away from. And I think in India, a very good example last year was in the Kashmir crisis, when we knew that a lot of the audience in Kashmir were effectively switched off by having the internet and telephone lines switched off. The BBC, amongst others, were able to provide independent information both to audiences in Kashmir, but also we saw from our digital traffic in the Kashmir crisis, huge spike in interest from audiences in Pakistan to read in Urdu how the world seems from Delhi and vice versa for audiences in India who want to understand in private, in the privacy of their own homes on digital platforms, Pakistan's worldview, but they exist in a media market where they are forbidden effectively to discuss that in either country. That is seen as an, uh, in, a, in a highly nationalist media climate that is seen as a, uh, a, as a non-patriotic thing to do. And I think you can see, that's just one example from India and Pakistan, but you can see those types of conflicts and tensions the world over where international broadcasters do have a role to play as a forum for reasoned debate, which national broadcasters have not been able to provide. Thank you, Mr. Angus. I, I want to bring in uh, Aruna Roy again. I also want to just ask her bluntly, what do you think, uh, Mrs. Roy, do you think that the BBC is doing a good job in India, Pakistan and in the region? Do you think that they actually do bring this different perspective how that Mr. Angus mentioned? Well, JB, I'm not saying this to be polite, but BBC is uh, one of the most relied on channels that's heard in Hindi, where I live in the villages. Remote villages, people listen to the BBC. There's too many, there are too many controversies and they don't know what's right. The BBC is really heard. And I only fear that the BBC is uh, shrinking perhaps in its coverage, maybe, because we don't hear as much of the local news as we used to hear before and many voices from very remote parts of India on the BBC. The BBC has done a great job in India, and I think uh, we would like the Indian radio stations to do likewise, because we are really city-centered, urban-centered. Our programs are not geared to the common person more often than not. And we are only really targets of news, they are not part of the news. Thank you, Ms. Aruna Roy. Um, now, I also want to remind our users that they can ask us questions and comment them under the video. Uh, we have another one here from the community. Um, Antonio from Bolivia wants to know from Jamie Angus and Peter Limburg. How important is diversity for your international audience? I think we already touched upon this a little bit, but maybe we can go more into detail. Are there regional differences? And would you say that there is a common denominator, denominator around the world when it comes to diversity? Mr. Angus, do you want to start? Yeah, thank you. It's it, That's such a good question because just thinking, so an example in Latin America where our Portuguese service for Brazil, BBC Brazil, it's making a really big contribution to media diversity there, because actually, even in a country relatively uh, well-developed modern media market like Brazil, there's a huge lack of diversity uh, amongst um, black Brazilian audiences and black Brazilian presenters. So there's a huge skew in favor of, uh, of white participants in the media industry there. And then if you go from Brazil on the one hand, you know, back to India, where we were talking uh, about caste diversity, a completely different kind of diversity, actually. And each different media market across the world has a slightly different perception and, uh, and, and a different selection of protected groups. And it seems to me that the conversation in much wealthier, much mature media markets like Germany and the United Kingdom is much more focused on questions of diversity typical of those more advanced economies. And actually, in some of the very different countries that we broadcast into, diversity, you know, the caste diversity in India is actually a completely different set of arguments to uh, black and South Asian diversity in the UK. So I do think you're right. Behind the question, you have to have a very broad mind to think about the theme of diversity in different ways. 
Thank you, Mr. Angus. Mr. Limburg, what are your thoughts on that? I think uh, Jamie Jamie said a lot of uh, also of my thoughts. So maybe just uh, a short uh, thing uh, concerning media literacy, because uh, we have the DW Academy, um, which is working also around the globe and in Latin America, and diversity is also one of the topics they they address. And I think uh, it's very important to to remind uh, journalists and, and media houses that it's very important to to reflect on on their users and and not only have one sort of uh, people um, uh, bringing the news or, or explaining the world but also uh, trying to be really diverse in, in in program and management this is something which we try to address thank you Jeff from Australia now wants to know from Aruna Roy besides the media who else should help make people resilient against divisive strategies I would say politics. Uh, all our countries suffer from politicians who want to take the narrowest definition of identity to divide us. So I would say the politicians, the political ideologies, the political positions, the use of uh, democracy, how democracy is used now very often just to get the vote, thereafter the whole principles and the, and the processes of democracy, the spirit of democracy set aside and we really become more or less uh, well dictator dictator driven countries and i think when uh, and and it's the independence of all the institutions the judicial institutions parliament of of the various commissions that are set up to inquire into the independence of these institutions and of course an independent free media but also an independent media that is not threatened by the state and doesn't succumb to threats by the state all these composite and enough now of Thank you, Mrs. Roy. Um, again, I want to uh, thank all our users for sending in interesting questions and all of your insights. You can also discuss in the comments and um, I would love to have a very lively discussion in the comments as well. Um, now we heard from Aruna Roy that politics is also responsible to create um, diversity and to help people to become resilient against divisive strategies. And um, I, I want to, Aruna Roy, I want to have a, I want to say, uh, ask a follow-up question on this. Um, because we know, and you spoke about this before, and I, I promised that we would speak, speak about this later on in the show, you spoke about um, the riots against Muslims and how the media helped to, 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 to carry this, this atmosphere and the sentiment against Muslims and the racism. Um, what do you think, why is that? And do you think that the media is also helping this national, these nationalist ideas and um, in the sense of patriotism and, and trying to promote patriotism? I wouldn't say, uh, make it a blanket statement. I would say that there are some newspapers which have been very courageous and very brave. Some news channels on, on, the, uh, on the electronic side have been very courageous and brave. But by and large, the jingoism and the hatred has become a, a common discourse because of the extensive, pervasive way in which media has taken it to people. And because we are a very naive and, and, and in one sense, a very, uh, very, uh, we're just beginning to be literate about media of, the, of, of electronic media, we tend to take many things that they say as truth and also as social media, but we're not talking about social media now, but that also has fed into it. So I would really say that uh, newspapers are not all the same, media houses are not all the same, but the majority of them have carried the narrative that has spread a certain degree of hate and fear, fear amongst the community that is being hated and hatred by the majority community of the minority community, which could have would have been unheard of or unthought of. Say 20 years ago, I wouldn't have believed that India would have a narrative of the way it has today. But I'm afraid media has contributed to create the narrative and to sustain it. Thank you so much. Um, we have another question here from Karin from Germany. She has a question for Jamie Angus. Uh, and she asks, is a deeper knowledge about forms of structural discrimination part of regular internal training programs for leaders and heads of departments at the BBC? 
Um, yes, that's right. I mean, certainly along uh, with other senior managers in the industry who find this familiar, I've undergone, <clears throat> you know, training in uh, unconscious bias uh, and uh, other issues that enable me, I think, to <clears throat> read more sensitively the concerns of my own staff. Um, but I do feel myself, you know, limited sometimes by my own experience and identity. And I think one of the things that I enjoy the most about my role as a manager at the moment is the ability to work with the extraordinarily diverse selection of teams that we have. And, you know, I'm sure Peter and others will will have similar experiences that I've spent a lot of time in the aftermath of the George Floyd incident in the United States and a lot of anger and upset and hurt amongst our own black staff about not only about the story itself but also how in some cases the media have responded to it i've spent a really you know thought-provoking and enjoyable series of lengthy conversations simply listening to my own staff and in a very trying to be non-defensive and simply in listening mode and asking them to explain to me how the events make them feel and what they feel as a broadcaster and as an employer that BBC should do more and better to respond to stories like that. It's not the case that we can necessarily say yes to everything, but I think that process of just listening over a very long and extended period has been extremely useful to me. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Limbrook, I also want to ask you the same question uh, because the debate in the UK is very different from the debate on structural discrimination and racism that we had in the past weeks. So what are your thoughts? Do you think that the knowledge on structural discrimination is, should be part of internal training programs and um, also for heads of departments at DW? Yes, so we are working on this and uh, partly we've done it in the past, but uh, maybe not enough. So I think uh, in the future we will focus much more on this and also on trainings uh, which are which you have to go through and they're not uh, only voluntary. And I think it's not only the question of uh, training the, uh, the, 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 um, the managers, it's also uh, talking about the topic with the whole um, uh, people working in the uh, media house. And that's what we did. We did internal um, uh, talk shows about uh, people of, with people of color and uh, to, to just let uh, the, the let's say the majority of, of uh, the staff listen to what are the topics, what are the, the fears, the, the, the anger, and uh, what is the actual daily discrimination and racism, which is also part of our society and also part of our operation sometimes. So I think it's really important that the whole, whole staff realizes that this is really an issue about diversity and not only one passing topic, which uh, will be will be closed down in a couple of months. No, it's something which we all have to go better and we will have a really um, advantage afterwards when our staff is really trained. I think that's an important point. And now we have another question. I think now really a lot of questions are coming in, which is really interesting. Myra from Pakistan has a question also to Jamie Angus and Peter Lurmborg. And uh, she asks, BBC and DW are members of the DG7, a group of international broadcasters from countries such as the US, France, Japan, and the Netherlands. Um, and her question is, when you have your annual meetings, is diversity a topic you discuss? Mr. Angus, can you start, please? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely it is. And um, uh, Peter can say a little more as he very kindly hosted the DG7 uh, in December just past in Berlin. But absolutely, I think we did discuss that, not, all, not least because the world already feels like it's changing in this regard, uh, but because, uh, as I said in my previous answer, our own staff are our own sternest critics, quite rightly. And I think all of us, uh, as you know, major global employers of a very diverse workforce across multiple continents, uh, wanted to share the experiences and the things that we've learned uh, and talk about both the diversity within our own staff, but also editorial diversity, you know, how do we take on board these great themes of the rise of populist and anti-establishment politics? These are really, really important editorial diversity questions for all of our organizations. And it was something really useful, actually, when we gathered in December in Berlin that we shared together. Thank you, Mr. Angus. Mr. Limburg, the question was also, sorry, yeah. I'm very sorry to interrupt you. The question was also addressed uh, to you. 
Yeah, I think uh, we discussed these topics. Uh, we at DW, we, we have uh, a diversity manager since last year. And uh, so I think it's always good to, to share information about uh, where we stand, uh, what are the projects we, we have. And as Jamie said, it's also about the editorial diversity. So to, to see um, that we bring really a broad um, picture, that we bring different opinions into, into the discussions. So I think uh, these DG7 meetings are really, really interesting for all of us to learn from each other also on the topic of diversity. And especially for you, Mr. Limburg, DW is a German public broadcaster, an international broadcaster. And of course, we know that Germany has a background when it comes to racism and fascism. Um, do you also think that DW has a special role when it comes to diversity in the media? I think uh, all democracies uh, should should work on this. And uh, yes, Germans uh, have uh, their past in uh, um, in, in the Second World War, and it still affects the way they think. But I think it's more also the question that Germany hasn't been uh, really used to be a migration country. So um, only since the 60s or 70s, people came into Germany uh, on a large scale. And still, I think Germans have to learn um, how to treat uh, minorities properly. And uh, I think this is something where we can where we can contribute, but uh, we are not the ones who should uh, be be the, the the teachers of everybody. But I think it's just vital for us to to always raise these discussions and to report on what is going on in Germany, and uh, the, the, the the sort of discussions which are which are discussed here. Thank you, Mr. Limburg. Uh, I think we have a few more c questions coming in, but until then, I also want to ask uh, Aruna Roy what her thoughts on this are, and maybe and we, uh, we only have a couple of minutes left, and she, maybe she can also uh, give recommendations to uh, Jamie Angus and Peter Limburg from an activist's view. Um, what are your thoughts, Ms. Aruna Roy? Uh, I think we need far more stories about the people who are diverse, but who, by this immense diversity, comes together and asking for similar rights from the state, from the government. We need to get stories of the diversity between, I don't think, recently we had a big discussion on how, whether it was James Floyd in the US or killing Faisan in Delhi or killing two people who maintained a shop in Tamil Nadu. The, the violence of the state manifested through its police on innocent people, and especially those who are either in custody or being taken into custody, is something that is universal. So in this diversity, there's so much that is common. And I think it's this commonality that's going to make ordinary people etch a new world. And I think that those of you who are in media have such a powerful tool in your hands that if you should write, write extensively and cross-fertilize these ideas, there will be a global reaction to the kind of restrictive ideologies that are creeping into our countries. And we will be unified in protesting against it. And today the world is small, uh, as has been shown even, through, even during COVID-19, we're talking to each other. Why shouldn't we try it that way? And I would really think both of you have a very very important role to play in this. Thank you, Mrs. Roy. Indeed, the world is small, and that's why we're also able to talk in this way and have this discussion today. Uh, Maria from Spain wants to know from Peter Limburg and Jamie Angus, do you have tips uh, as to how to make news about minorities interesting and appealing to audiences who are not part of those minorities? Um, I, well, I would say let, let your own staff be your guide and let your own staff tell their own stories and explain their own stories and communities to a much, much wider audience. I think that's by far been the most effective way that we've uh, that we've done that in terms of our great selection of audiences. We have such a such a great range of talent amongst our own staff and actually for them to be able to tell their own community stories to global audiences, I think is a huge privilege. Thank you. Mr. Limburg, do you want to wrap this up and add your comments as well? 
Well, I think uh, absolutely right, Jamie, but maybe also to, to make these stories uh, um, so that uh, you also broadcast success stories of people uh, which are from minorities or um, marginalized and and show that they that they are absolutely able to to do everything everybody else can do also so that you not only have a um, an, a victimized picture of them but also a picture of uh, uh, people can do whatever they want if you just let them and so I think this is something which uh, I would also recommend if I would do a story about it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that lively and insightful debate. I'm sure we've all learned new things and have taken on new perspective. And thank you also to our viewers for your questions and comments. I'm afraid that's all we have uh, time for today, but please do join us again for the next Global Media Forum Digital Session on September 7th, when we will be discussing the media's role in a European public sphere against the backdrop of the German EU Council presidency. My name is Vaslat Hasrat Nazimi, and it was a pleasure to be a host today. Thank you.